Hey, everybody, welcome back to Too Many Men. My name is Allison Lucan, and I couldn't be more excited for today's episode. Part of that reason is because I'm joined by one of my very favorite writing voices. I was reflecting on this the other day, Sarah, about just your ability to be so wise, so smart, even bringing in advanced stats. Don't think I didn't see that. And yet still having a sense of humor and something that makes me always want to read what you write. How are mm -hmm. you today? Oh, I'm fabulous now. Thank you so much, Allison. I know we have other things we're excited about to today's podcast and we'll get into them, but the introduction, that one might have been my favorite. And we, of course, would not be too many men with another person who just amazes the hell out of me. And that is Shayna Goldman. She's not just putting out literally season recaps for teams that have been eliminated <laughs> from the playoffs. She's doing full on com comprehensive award previews for the major NHL awards. And the woman is upcycling at a ridiculous rate after her sewing machine got broken and she had to replace it, what, four times? How many yeah, times? Three, 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 three. So Shayna, say hi. Hi. You know what? Someone has to teach the world about defense admission. Me and you have been on for years. So we got to talk about the defensive awards, right? Absolutely. I know. Your Selkie I'm... story. Sorry. I just wanted to say it was incredible. I read it this Thank morning. You. Like I'm going through figuring out who I'm voting for. And it's like one of the main resources I use. Thank you. I love that. Shane, are you, are you voting this year? Did you get a ballot? Yes, I am. Okay. Oh, we were, Hell it's yeah, funny. We got worried because they emailed like, oh, you're going to get a ballot today. And immediately Dom texted me like, did you get your ballot? Cause I didn't. And I'm like, no. And then I like two hours later, I'm like, wait, it says afternoon. It says afternoon. And we were both like, okay. Cause like, we care about this. I know like we yes. shouldn't, but we, we, act, no, we like, should. If, but yeah, like we should, I feel like sometimes it's like, you put actual lame? effort into it is what you're saying. Yeah. Is it lame to care about it? I don't know. But sometimes like, it's nice to see how we can talk about things differently. Right. And that's what the awards have been the last few years. Nice. Yes. Well, and just to be clear for people who may not know, you have to be a independent member of the media to be able to vote for NHL awards. That's why someone like me is not a, a, a allowed to take on a ballot. And also not every um, professional hockey writers association member gets a ballot every year. So um, that was no shade, just making sure that that both of our girlies were, were on their way to make the people know what they should think. All right. <laughs> know what you should think. Well, listen, I mean, listen to us, please. <laughs> um, all right, let's get right to it. Sarah, what time is it? It's time for... Oh, news. <laughs> Shout out Benny Drawbars, who has provided us an awesome Too Many Men branded Bit O News branded drum and complimentary drumsticks. Thank you, Sarah, for leading us in. We have one very quick update, and we'll be posting this on our socials once we have this complete. Don't forget our socials are at two underscore much underscore man on both Instagram and the Twitter. Um, but we were honored to um, have a, quite a few of you go ahead and buy Torts merch from our merch website, which is too many men merch.com. And all proceeds from that Torts merch is going to be donated to Pause a Pennsylvania, actually Philly based um, pet charity that takes care of animals that Torts has visited. We know that's a cause close to his heart, and we are proud to be sending them over $100. So thank you all so much. Good job, Torts. Never stop Tortsing. We hope that by the time people listen to this episode, maybe the Flyers still have a chance. We'll see. Um, but let's get into it. To that point, we're going to wait for the playoff talk, y'all, um, because we are recording this on Tuesday. As pretty much everyone knows, there's some big games tonight that may or may not decide that final spot in the East. So we'll be bringing you our thoughts on the playoffs next week. Yes, that will mean they have started. And that's because we are smart and we want to see the first games before we talk out of our asses, not knowing how these things are going to go down. <laughs> But let's focus on two big stories in the hockey world this past week. And unfortunately, the first one is what seems to be the all but confirmed, but confirmed because everyone's saying it like it's factual, is the sale of the Arizona Coyotes. And for those of you who haven't fully followed along, Arizona was basically thought to be full on into the process of buying a parcel of land to build a new arena, this being their 8,006th attempt to build a new home for their NHL team, when it came out that actually all along ownership of the Coyotes had been working to sell the team to the league, who will then sell the team to Salt Lake City, 
where it is pretty much inevitable that the team will be playing come next season. These are the facts. They're also the facts that they put out a ridiculous statement on social, basically, that was word salad. Um, but unfortunately, so much of this has been really, really messy. So much of this has unfortunately resulted in players, staff, fans finding out some incredibly hard to deal with news via social media and or news reports. And that really fucking sucks. Um, we'll get to the fallout here in a second. But Sarah, what do you make of the fact that this chapter of the Arizona Coyotes for now seems to be closed? I mean, God, I'm writing a story about it. So I'm just trying to think about all the angles. And it's like, of course, this franchise in its current iteration with the current management simply can't exist and it couldn't exist for probably three years that it has been existing but the way it went from kind of the lies and the backtracking and the okay well the slow burn of knowing something was going to happen until suddenly they're moving to fucking Utah it's like the craziest thing in the world to me like we didn't get a second to mourn like all the fans all the people that cover the team the people that are employed by it. And of course, like it brings in question to players around the league and the players of the team. Like, of course, everybody knew that this franchise was going to potentially move, but like Salt Lake City didn't come up until recently. So it's just, of course, when you're moving somewhere you did not expect to move, it's like, it's just a weird situation. And it's sad that it's happening so fast. Yeah, it is for sure. And it, well, here's a fun fact. I went to pull up that crazy ass all caps coyotes statement and it's oh, gone. They God. deleted it. Of course it is. They're such um, a mess. It is. But Shayna, again, we're going to, we're going to get into some of the fallout even more like Sarah was talking about, but unfortunately, while this was really messy and seems to be, have been handled poorly at every single turn, it does seem like from a business perspective right now, this might be the right decision to keep a 30-second franchise afloat, especially financially, when even if the Morello family did win this land auction, they were estimating at least three to four years before an NHL arena would be ready to be played in. Your thoughts on the new franchise being located in Utah? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like This, this situation, I feel like, had no easy answer to it and it's because of how the coyotes have operated my my honestly my biggest question is how the marulo group was vetted in the first place because i have serious questions because we have seen throughout their tenure of ownership things come up uh katie strang did a great profile on it a couple of years ago there were rumors about not paying bills defaulting on payments they were it, like there's a reason they got to this point and are playing at a college arena i think it's obviously a good thing to get this team on stable ground. And that was the biggest issue, I think, with any relocation conversations was how can we be adding to the league when there is a team playing at a college arena while they can sit there saying, but hey, our profits are better because our operating costs are lower. It's still not a good thing. It's horrible for the fans and for the players. But if the new ownership group is going to, I don't know, care and be willing to spend, which it does seem like is going to happen already that feels like a step in the right direction from a team that just keeps spinning their wheels look at their strategy every deadline except for this year you move players out so you don't have to pay them to bring guys on ltir so insurance can pick it up instead of you like that is a serious issue i almost wish not almost i do wish the nhl stepped in sooner because it feels like this had to happen but the way it's happening is the biggest issue of all right when we saw that social media tirade of we're staying we're staying and i know uh. it's a social media coordinator is not an owner, but don't think that this stuff doesn't get vetted when it's about something so important. There's there's a message that everybody has to approve on, right? So at first I didn't have an issue with it where it's, hey, look at our, these are our plans. I think that's a great way to instill confidence, right? We are bidding for this land and this is what we hope to build. Great. Forget the issues of, do they even have the money to build? Does anyone trust them to do it? The mayor statement, but right there, you could have stopped. And the way they kept digging their heels in, there's zero percent we lose this build, uh, this the bid, you lost the votes already. You've been in this position before, so you're overcommitting there. And then to find out that management ownership the entire time was going behind the scenes anyway and putting out two messages, it makes it all the more convoluted. It takes away any ounce of trust that was left. So the bar is very low for this new ownership group in Utah to to pass. 
Sarah, the the new ownership group, which is I should <clears throat> say their names. It's the Ryan and Ashley Smith. Uh, it's their family, their family money. Ryan Smith has been really the face of this whole thing. They say they're ready and willing to help and cooperate with the NHL to be ready. But while the NHL will be playing in a bigger building next season in Salt Lake, it's still not necessarily going to be a true NHL arena. Now the F Smith family is going to work to do what they can, but they're still going to need to build a new arena there as well. Is this enough of an improvement operationally? We don't know what it looks like, but what do you think about this kind of still being just a step along the way? It's not fully formed yet. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's still going to be in the top three oldest arenas in the NHL. They're absolutely going to need to redo it. Are they willing to do that? What the, the sports landscape in general is so interesting in Utah, right? Like, obviously, the Jazz are pretty popular there, but, like, are they popular because they're the only sport? Like, what's going to happen when somebody shares the wealth? Um, just, like, where are the – I don't know. There's so many logistics, and, of course, um, he, Ryan Smith, the ownership group, wants to kind of let Gary do his thing. That's been clear, so it's, like – is Gary going to mess it up? Like he was really riding hard for Arizona until he wasn't. And it's like, there's so many factors that we still don't really know yet. That's making it difficult, but like, did it have to happen this fast? It feels like it did at this point. Right. And then somehow the Coyotes owner is going to walk out with a billion dollars, which it seems like he needs. If he wants to go through the bid, it seems like he needs this money to make it happen at this point. Well, and let's talk about that, Shana. So part of part of the what we understand, and again, this is not all finalized yet. So until stuff is final, it could all change. But it seems to be that part of this deal is that Marillo is going to have a five year, I believe it is, claim to purchase any franchise that should go to Arizona, because by all accounts, Arizona is a sports market that the NHL wants to be in. What do you think of that? Because there's the business side of that. And to your point, like, in a way, if Marullo gets a billion dollars and invests it right back into the league and bringing another team to the league, on the surface, that's good. But from an operations perspective, I mean, other reporters, I, I have not talked to anyone directly involved in this, but um, other reporters have shared just the extreme level of frustration and sadness by the way this was handled. Can you trust this to be the person to bring the NHL back to the Arizona market? No, can't trust him to do it's anything. Yeah, it's not even this. It's also all of the bills he's owed and all of the things that he, like, laws he broke. And we're just like, okay. And he's how like, he handled his players, right? Like, yeah. I, I get if the owner isn't one that feels that they have to go talk to the players, but the players shouldn't be finding out from the media. And if the owner's not, I don't know, maybe he should make damn sure someone high up in the organization is there as well to, to help everyone kind of go through this. I don't know how you trust him. I, but on the other hand, I get why the NHL is doing this, right? Because if not, he could drag this shit out and make it another season of hell for the Coyotes, another season of hell for revenue, and just create a problem. So I get that they have to throw him a bone to an extent, but the man still owns the road uh, the Roadrunners, and Correct. that isn't cheap, right? They're going to be playing at ASU now. Like, here, Correct. ASU, this is who you get in the divorce. Um, and that's I, it's a good thing for fans. I think that there's a way to lean into the college vibe more than the Coyotes ever did, right? An AHL mm -hmm. team, younger players. Like, I think it could work, but I think that'll be a good test to see his ownership now that the Coyotes are out of the mix to see if he should ever have a claim. But should he? No. Should he ever come near a professional franchise again? No, absolutely not. It's a disaster. It's embarrassing for the league. Well, yeah, but I mean, again, if you think about it coming, particularly as we know with the NHL being so gate-driven, you kind of feel like they ha they did have to do it now, right? Because they need some yeah. more seats and they need that HRR because of the pandemic and all the things. One interesting wrinkle, and again, I want to be very clear, we have great empathy and we are so sorry for the people who are directly affected by this news and have to literally either be forced to or decide if they can pick up their entire lives and move to a completely different city, not even anywhere remotely near to where they have been. Some people that might be feasible, some people not. And so- we have great empathy for the anxiety that this might be causing. But on the flip side, Shana already illustrated Arizona was really using um, interesting ways to not have to spend money on players and trying to go as bare bones as possible. 
this is a roster that is going to have players come over. We believe our understanding is that contracts will be sold to the new franchise, I believe is the current version of news I've been hearing, but there's going to be roster spots to be filled, which could be really enticing for a new general manager, a new team and hockey ops. What could be exciting about what happens to this team on the ice next season, Sarah? I mean, there are really good prospects in cooking in the kitchen. There's good opportunity. I mean, the Coyotes, we've seen them go through this cycle where they're almost there, they're almost there, and then they lose it. And it's like they just have never bit the bullet to actually take the next step to make the playoffs and go far in the playoffs. And they just – the cycle kept repeating itself and repeating itself. And it's like maybe this actually is the impetus – to get them to break the cycle and say, okay, fresh start, like we can handle this better if they learn from the mistakes. And they, I mean, I know they're retaining a lot of the staff, but like maybe they can make different choices in the same way. Shana, what are you excited about from a roster construction perspective with this? I'm pumped. This is a project I think I'm working on next week is like, what's the best roster they could build with free agents in mind and contract projections for them and players who might get traded. So I'm, I'm going to start, you know, playing my little imposter GM bullshit on this, but I like, listen, it's, it's exciting. I'm, I'm mostly excited. It's not just for the young guys, right. For Logan Cooley and Josh Stone to have a different experience from everybody else. Right. That we've seen. I am hyped for someone like Clayton Keller to get some good talent alongside him. Like, look at the Red Wings right now. I don't know if either of you saw the quotes from David Perron about how they're, they're doing this for Dylan Larkin, the shit he's gone through in mm -hmm. Detroit these last few years and how that they want to make it. Like, I, I'm i like, I will run through a wall for this man. I, know. I feel like we're going to hit that point with Clayton Keller soon because his his time in the NHL cannot be that fun. Um, And he's such a good player and you want him to be that like franchise cornerstone. So if they can get him some real talent, like it's it's so exciting to think about. It feels like the building blocks could be there if management didn't keep fucking kicking them over every chance they got. So I I want to see an ownership group that's like ready to to do this and and see how the Pacific can look, right? Because I think sometimes we look at the Pacific and are like whatever because the Ducks and the Sharks are weighing it down, but there could be a lot of up and coming teams like the Ducks, like the Coyotes, mm -hmm. like the Kraken that push those teams like the Oilers in Vegas, and that is so fun to think about. 100%. And I will say, let's let's end with wherever you guys want to take your comments. I've said, said mine, but what do we, I mean, just the people who are affected, the fans, we look at, we talk about growing the sport in non-traditional markets, which there are so many of those now. And of course, the poster child is Austin Matthews, but there are so many young kids going to these games and who are learning how to play or even learning what hockey is in a state where, you know, 20 years ago, that really wasn't even a thing and 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 my heart breaks for those fans. I've I've covered a fan base that has had threats of of relocation and it's it's not fun. Um just any closing thoughts on how this scenario has all gone down, Sarah and Shana, whichever one you wants to go. Yeah, I will say um Craig Morgan, who I mean, best reporter ever, like he's the OG and the only like the number one go-to unanimously when it comes to coyotes. So read his work, continue to read his work. He said he'd be fine and like he still has a job, like there's still much to cover, but he reported that the youth initiatives that have been started will continue to start or continue to happen. And there's just no Austin Matthews if there isn't the Arizona Coyotes. There's so many things. It just, it sucks when you hear the, I mean, obviously I covered the Carolina Hurricanes too. And I wrote a story with John Forslund about the last day of the Whalers. And it's so just good. like the legacy that team has will always be there, but it's so frustrating just going online and seeing people who don't understand or are being willfully ignorant about the situation. It's like, it's not that there are no fans. It's the same when we talk about the WNBA, where people are now saying, oh, I like Caitlin Clark and I know her now, so the WNBA is relevant. It's like, no, people have always cared, but they didn't have the resources and they had this owner that kept messing up on multiple fronts and they're not making the right choices like of course you're not going to bring in the all of the fans that you possibly can so I don't know I just feel for the fans and having their time with the team kind of just marred by stereotypes like that Shana 
Yeah. Um, I feel for the fans. I feel for everyone who works for the organization. I feel for how it was handled and what comes next. Um, you know, I know some people don't think it's a big deal, but you, you agreed or potentially committed for years to spend your life in Arizona. And now the rug just got pulled out from under you and nobody felt the, you know, the need to have an ounce of courtesy and talk to you. Like that's terrible. I think a lot of us have obviously made jokes at the Coyotes expense and whatever, and it's never targeted at the players or the organization, the people working within it. It's at the top. There's a reason I think some of us are kind of relieved to see there's some sort of solution here because ownership has been that bad in Arizona and there's been so much instability and it's good for the game to see that change. Um, but, you know, it, it still sucks that this is a market that cares. It's just nobody has cared to give them the time, the attention, the resources they need to thrive. It's not easy to be an NHL franchise. It's not as simple as pretending to have money and saying, hey, we're going to do X, Y, Z and never following up on it. Like, it just, it sucks and they deserve more. And, you know, I think people make fun of how the NHL tried to keep them there, but like, there's a reason for it, but you got to a point where you have to make a change and it feels like we're at that point. So hopefully we see the investment the team deserves and hopefully all Arizona fans are not completely and totally fucked out of this, but um, just some stability would be nice. I think for everybody, right? Like it's, it's, it's about a slice just of rice. Crumb. I want to give everyone their slice of rice. I'm sorry. This this is it. Everybody, I'm going to get a bag of rice, sprinkle it out. I, I hope the vibes wow. at that last game are amazing, though. I know. Can I say one last thing of that course. I'm thinking about with Salt Lake? Like, I don't want to be a bummer, a downer, whatever. And I know the greedy NHL is going to expand probably to Atlanta and Houston, too, right? But the lack of diversity in a place like Salt Lake City, mm. it's palpable. Like, mm. yeah. And it's maybe the NHL does have a good chance of surviving there because it's white, but it's so white. It's so, I don't know. I, it, it's disappointing because I'd want relocation to happen in a more diverse area where you could really grow the game. That's a yeah. really good I, point. One more. I, I think it's funny now that it's like, all right, everyone can shut up about Arizona now, right? Like we're seeing it now. It's like, well, okay, this team has an attendance issue. Just stop. Okay, just stop. We're not, we don't need to talk about Quebec right now. We don't need to talk about the Jets' uh, attendance is down. Like, I feel like I saw that the second the news broke. Mm. Um, like, it's it's fine. Just let's all take a breather. And also, like, while all this is going on, just be aware of all the reports going on because I think it got really hectic at the beginning how it was being reported. And sometimes people just rush out there to get their shit out. Like, just, like, be aware read a little bit of everything, try to take it all in stride. It's like a lot before just spewing and having like a wrong opinion because you read crap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about something much, much more positive, at least right now. And that is the conclusion of one of the most incredible tournaments that I've seen in a while. And if you weren't watching Women's Worlds, particularly the two medal matches this past Sunday, you were doing it wrong. Uh, both games go to overtime, both games incredibly amazing. I literally like covered my eyes when the US lost gold to Canada because of a too many men <laughs> penalty. Yeah. We don't like that kind of karma. But just so many great stories coming out of this tournament. We're seeing wonderful players like Layla Edwards come up and just crush it and show different diverse faces in the game of hockey. New names, names bringing attention to the PWHL, bringing attention to college programs. Shayna, you are our go-to for all things in the women's side. What stands out to you as some of the biggest stories to take away from, from these past couple of weeks of games? Yeah, this was not your average USA-Canada game. Um, for USA, the big storyline is the young guns. You're seeing Kirsten Sims and Taylor Heisey and Caroline Harvey be difference makers with Layla Edwards. It's exciting to see. Because I think a couple of years ago, especially before this new coaching staff took over, we had some serious concerns about the changing of the guard when it felt like Canada was racing ahead with that with the rise of Sarah Fillier and willing to give her those meaningful minutes. And it's not to say the veterans shouldn't get minutes, like play Sarah Nurse and play Kendall Coyne Schofield on, on both sides of it and play Marie-Philippe Poulin. Of course, the you know she's leading in shot attempts every time she's on the ice. Like she's killing it. Um, but it's nice to see both teams now embracing that. The other thing is watch out for Czechia. Um, they, Dude. They, okay, so there's something about a Carla McLeod run team to me. It 
she brings this disruptive nature. And it's funny because you look at Chucky the list, you know, you're so, and you're like that, that is what they are. And then Ottawa in the PWHL is run so similarly. The tournament's going to be in Czechia next year. We're seeing them take down teams like Finland, which is a big deal because Finland's often in medal contention too. Um, they are the team to watch. And the final point is about the time and investment in women's sports that we are dying to see. First of all, it was very nice to have some games on ESPN Plus when they weren't on NHL Network. Um, I was able to watch Japan, China that way much easier. Or I think it was Germany, Japan I was watching. And Czechia, Germany. Like, those games were on ESPN Plus. Love that. But the games for USA Canada, first of all, it is a pain in the ass when you can't go back and watch replays. Uh, in my opinion, very hard to watch the game. Um, but it's not as, as, as accessible on NHL Network as it could be if it were available on both. Or if there were some other streaming option. Um, there were so many issues you could see during that USA Canada game of people in the US in particular being able to watch it. You know, it was more available in Canada. So that was a pain in the ass. Second of all, I would love one ounce of interest in the coverage. Um, NHL Network handled the intermissions instead of kicking to just the TSM feed, which we've seen happen before. And on some nights, it was like painful to get through. And I don't want to knock the analysts who are put in the position to to break down games i think dave reed was doing one and you could just tell this isn't what he covers every day he doesn't know the ins and outs yeah. of every player and that's fine but the difference between them breaking down the tape there versus then oh let's talk about the blackhawks in the intermission is so startling it i don't know why jamie hirsch wasn't given more games because you know she's invested in it um, it just feels like there's a way bring, bring in new people. If you, if you're covering this game, bring in an, an expert to help elevate that panel, to give these players the coverage they deserve. After the game was over, they did a rapid fire recap and the amount of, um, silences that there were because we were getting quick one sentence descriptors. And I'm sorry, even if you don't know the players in the ins and outs, there's more you could do. It was just so disappointing. Sarah, your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was really focused on um, the Frozen Four and kind because of, I write for Elite Prospects too, so I was kind of more dialed in on this. This who, week, who won that? Oh, oh, that Frozen Four. I thought you meant the uh, real Frozen Four, the women's Frozen Four. Oh no, we got we say we got the best first, you know. <laughs> yes, no, you're correct in that. But um, yes, I was watching the men's, but your point brought me into how much I disliked hearing Colby Cohen on it because he was so biased towards BU because he went there. Like, I just, I couldn't do that. But anyway, yep. yeah, it was, I totally agree it, was it was a lot. Yeah. You, you saw it too. Oh, oh yeah. I was right. The whole tournament, I'm sitting there like, oh, but at least, they, at least they took that. They had intermission specials that yeah. was really geared towards yeah. them. Bucci, say what you will. He knows what he's talking about when it comes to college posture. He cares about it and yep, he has true. a passion for it. And you need people like that on these panels exactly like what you said i'd love to see more people i know the fact that the pw like the these players are playing right now that have been on these panels too like it's it's tough but there's a list of people that we could have seen that are more equipped than i guess what was happening and just part of it is just it's an afterthought for nhl network but what isn't sorry yeah, yeah it's just unfortunate too i mean you know i watched aj malesco for example was calling the the mm -hmm. crack and blues game for mm -hmm. ESPN when I would have loved to have her come in on the intermissions. And I do, I mean, I think Jamie Hirsch did a great job. And I thought Kevin Weeks did a really he tried his very best to to be in Except there. Except for the I, coach's daughter comments about the Sir Daphne. I was I was dying at the yeah. end of that. I mean it, and here's the but thing. Yeah, like, I, but he, it was better. It was better. We like when I covered that the, the rivalry series game that was here like and I try to at least keep a a basic level of knowledge of what's going on in the women's game because it's important like I was terrified because I was like bothering poor Shana and, and Mike you, you every worked your ass off to prepare though like the amount yeah. of time and energy you put into that is I, I think above and beyond what most people would do and even if you don't hit that level it's still it's something and I think you know I think that's I'm certainly not saying, and I still didn't feel as prepared as I should have been, or as those athletes deserve in my opinion. And I think that's, that's what needs to change is we recognize that right or wrong. Sometimes networks don't bring in the best people because they have people under contract. And those are the people that they can't just go to the money tree and pay another analyst to come in, even if that's the right decision. But 
it is up to us to to put in the energy to do what we can to tell the best stories and at least know some things, um, even if we can't know all the things about a team or a player. Yep. But um, I'm telling you, if you guys did not watch those last two games, like they were just incredible. And what's really, really exciting is that a lot of those players you just watched, as well as players that you didn't watch, are coming right back at you with the women's game because the PWHL season is about to start up with games beginning this Thursday and teams are in the playoff hunt. Sarah, is there anything else just about the whole women's side and the tournament and, and what we're seeing happen in that game that that's important for you to share? Yeah, I just love the moment. And we have an interview coming up that kind of touches on this, but I love the moment that women's sports is having right now that is a result of all of the moments that came before it and that it no when you think about an overnight celebrity or an overnight thing happening it's like no there's years of work put into this on other people's backs and it's nice to enjoy what's happening right now when you look at like I know the Washington Post reporter is tweeting out like Every day, women's sports are the most popular on the website. It's like, no, ge people genuinely care right now. And we've always cared, but it's nice to see the opportunities and the more visibility that gets to happen when more people care. Yep. 100%. All right. Well, I don't think there's anyone better then that we can continue the conversation about that very topic, Sarah, I'm just going to tell the people when you hear Sarah's question on this, it was one of the best damn questions I've ever heard asked in my entire life of oh, any athlete by yep. any writer or reporter, um, because it's so smart. Um, Y'all, we have Hillary Knight on the show. Hillary fucking Knight came to talk to us. It was very, very cool. Thoughts on the awesome time we had talking to her before we turn <laughs> it over. <laughs> Let's go. We got Hillary Knight. <laughs> it's so cool. She's such a superstar. She really and, is. And like, she was so down to earth. Loved it. Very excited. Um, And I think we asked her like different thing. You know, it's not just about USA Canada and the games. Like, you know, you learn a lot. So, you know, we always talk about the growth of women's sports. And then there happen to be these peak moments like March Madness tournament or like USA Canada, like ride that fucking wave and enjoy it. Like, Watch the end of the PWHL season, get into the playoffs and just keep going. 100%. Well, let's turn it over to Hillary. We couldn't be more excited and thankful that she gave us a few minutes of her time in what is definitely a busy schedule and coming off what was surely an insane weekend and very emotional final championship game. So with that, my friends, we give you the queen, Hillary Knight. All right, everyone. Well, we are beyond thrilled to have the legend, the most medal acquiring athlete at Women's Worlds ever, and just overall general badass, Hillary Knight is with us. This is this might be a high point for the pod, my friends. I don't know that we've ever had someone of this stature, and we're so excited to have her and coming right off an exciting Worlds tournament, a great year, a great past 18 months for the women's game in general. And we've got some questions. Shane, I'll turn it over to you. So I'm sure a lot of people have asked you about the wild USA Canada game, but we wanted to get into some specifics. Um, we saw Layla Edwards and um, Sir Dacne put on a show at Worlds, and we always, you know, look to what we can learn from the stars like you, but is there anything new these young guns are showing you? Yeah, um, well, I mean, Layla Edwards had an unbelievable performance, and I'm I'm excited just, you know, as a hockey fan, as a Badger fan, as her teammate on Team USA, um, and then also just, you know, looking long-term, you know, her joining our league at some point. So it's really cool to see, um, you know, younger players step up and, and take the, the world stage by storm. And, um, obviously Sir Dacne got that big goal on us. Um, uh, but Layla was pivotal for us to even find our way in the finals and find the back of the net in the finals. So, um, you know, I can't think of a better person than to, to have the spotlight on her than, Layla, just as you know, a competitor and as a human being. I was trying to figure out a way to word this, but obviously the WNBA draft was last night, and there's so much like hype about Caitlin Clark, and it's it just makes you think like 
with the rise of the PWHL too, like how do we get excited about this moment in women's sports, but also acknowledge that women's sports have rocked forever and they're just getting kind of the resources now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't like, obviously it, the, the WNBA draft and Caitlin Clark and she had many moments, right. And, and WNBA has had many moments and um, where women's sport is right now, we're just getting more visibility and more attention and more conversations. It's always been great. Um, obviously, when there's more funding and resources, the level of competition increases. But now when we have the media and, um, you know, Caitlin Clark being a household name among many other, um, you know, individuals as well, whether it's in the March Madness or the, the draft that just happened, it, it's just awesome to have these conversations. And so I'm excited that we finally have a league for hockey and the best players in the world play in the same league. And now these conversations, these storylines are going to continue to develop and you never know who that next it person's going to be. But look at Layla. She steps up. You, a lot of people probably didn't know who Layla was unless they were following college hockey. And um, now they know who she is because of the spotlight of the world stage and the world's tournament. And if we can continue to, to capitalize on that success and also shine the same light at the professional level and garner the same visibility, we're going to be in a great spot. But I'm really excited where women's sports as a whole um, are right now. It's just outstanding. And we continue to feed off of one another and move the needle forward. Well, Hillary, you mentioned the new league and one league, all everyone together. And one of the things I've always loved about the women's game is that it's not afraid to be innovative, right? And you've changed up some rules in the new league. <laughs> Robo won't tell me why, but the, the Team USA has used two different power play formations in the past. <laughs> what are you most excited about with the rule changes? And is there still one that you would like to see come down the pipe? Yeah, I mean, I can't re reveal the power play changes either, <laughs> but uh, we like to keep people on our t their toes. No, um, you know, we just have so many good players. I think that's what it boils down to. But um, yeah, I mean, right now we're right outside the cusp of a playoff spot. So in the PWHL, we have, you know, if you win a game, you take three points, all three, all three. And right now I'm like, <laughs> okay, there's 15 points on the table. Let's go. Um, and we're five points out. But um, no, and the, the uniqueness of body contact and, um, you know, just disrupting the space, obviously even having a paid professional league is, is huge for, um, the sport, not only us right now level of competition, but the next generation coming up. So, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's outstanding. I, I can't, I hope my excitement's really coming through. What everyone's <laughs> just doing. a little bit, just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> So, you know, something we've learned over the years is how adaptive women have to be. You know, some players have to learn how to play forward in defense. You have to shift from national play back to league play. And now you're adjusting to new rules on the fly. How do you manage that? You know, it, it seems like everything happens so quickly. So how is that something that players can, you know, handle? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. I think um, for me personally, like that's been a huge um, growing pain is just figuring out how to play, um, you know, with players from, you know, different types of systems and whatnot and figuring out what that timing is and how to get into those spots or the, the different heat maps and, um, you know, having the wrinkle of, of body contact. Now you kind of approach the boards a little bit differently and your position with the puck. Um, but it, it's, it was nice to go back and play with our country um, to get that sort of uh, breath of fresh air. Obviously, we don't want to break for a month mid-season because you know there's a handful of players that aren't competing at Worlds um, that had to continue to train and be ready for when we start back up. But um, you know, I'll be taking the things uh, in that sort of energy that I just experienced with Team USA and try to um, infuse that into the way that I play with Boston and get ourselves into a playoff position. I loved watching you on ESPN and I was wondering if like what you learned from that experience and if it's something you're willing to kind of explore again. Um, I loved uh, being with ESPN because it was, I've always been worried because I've been playing for so long that there would be nothing that would give me the same uh, level of rise from like a competitor standpoint of, you know, when, when the, the, the red light goes like you're going right and so to get your blood flowing and pumping in that same way that you know I experience when I'm going out there for warm-ups or right before the puck drop was just really cool and I think too like I love learning and I love growing in different ways and I had I had an idea of how hard it was to be on the media side of things but to learn all these things at once and and where to how to prepare 
how to get your notes right, uh, the different types of information that you're taking in, where the cameras are, how to access different, you know, get between the benches, um, you know, whatever it may be, it's it's a huge growth experience for me and I'm really excited. And obviously when you work with great people, you get that team environment and that team aspect. And it's been a lot of fun learning and, and being able to grow in that way. Well, you've been crushing it for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously you came from, a college dynasty. And, you know, even at the college level, we're starting to see more and more programs get really strong. I'm obviously biased. Ohio State, second time <laughs> national champs. Yay, go team. I know you know Nadine Musrell a little bit. Yep. <laughs> um, but what are you seeing develop on the college landscape and seeing more and more powerhouses come up than just the usual maybe two, three teams that we saw for so long? Yeah, I think more teams are a part of the conversation. I was able to go up and watch the Frozen Four uh, most recently. And it was, it was fun to see the level of competition. I mean, it's it's even better than when I played. And I thought that was really challenging to just be in the WCHA. So um, it's cool to to see the game elevate at that level. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm so excited for anyone who's signing up for the sport now, because I can only imagine what college is going to be like and then what the professional landscape is going to be like. Um, just knowing all the success that, you know, these players have already had and continue to have. Did you cheer for Ohio State just a little bit? <laughs> no, I'm a bad <laughs> <laughs> But no, I mean, obviously, like I cheered for, um, you know, Kayla Barnes and Hannah Bilka, because those are, those are my OG girls. And um, I wanted them to win a natty, but, uh, you know, I'm a badger through and through. So it was tough. It was a tough one. <laughs> So something we talk about a lot is how the NHL really struggles to market themselves and players fail to show their personality. It feels like in the PWHL, that's changing. You know, you put out TikToks, we're seeing teams put out TikToks and a lot of emphasis on things like fit checks. Why is that important to do? I, I think because we play a team sport, because we wear so much equipment, fans need and players also need to be able to see uh, individually and, and, and players need to be able to express themselves. And, um, you know, I think it, it, it's awesome because instead of just seeing us in our equipment on the ice, you know, barreling down, trying to score a goal or block a shot or whatever it may be. Now you see, you know, you know, teammates on TikTok that you might not have, um, been able to see before, and then you get to meet them on social and see them play, um, in a hockey game. And, also, oh, what are their interests? You know, what do they do away from the game? Oh, I have that in similar to them, or that's something I can learn from or about more. So I just think it just diversifies who we are as individuals, because obviously we're these awesome hockey players, but that's not that's not just who we are, right? And so, um, you know, whether it's, you know, different hair, hairstyles or fit checks or Whatever it may be, I just think it adds to the game and it adds to those storylines and it just gets fans more invested and, and players more um, free to, to be themselves and express themselves. Well, speaking of hairstyles, you are certainly never one to have downtime. You're consistently <laughs> busy. You're launching a cool campaign with great clips called Show Your Flow. What can you tell our listeners about that? Well, I'm super excited because it's the second year of Show Your Flow and the first year was outstanding. Um, so I'm partnered with Great Clips and on a panel with Matthew Chuck and William Carlson, and we get to evaluate fan submissions. So fans need to submit their flow and uh, we're judging on creativity and, um, you know, uniqueness, I guess. Um, and, you know, winners get to go into the Hockey Hero Hall of Fame and have these awesome fan experiences um tickets for for games next year i mean hockey hair is just it's so important it's a part of the sport now you know whether you see it at the high school tournament you're like clicking in what's that or you see these submissions with great clips um with the show your flow contest i mean it's a it's a fun way for for fans to show their passion and express themselves and be a part of the hockey conversation and um yeah i'm i'm just super excited to see what what kind of submissions we're going to have. All right. Well, Hillary, we are just so jazzed to have time to talk with you. You are just the absolute best. Um, we are so proud to see all that you're doing both on and off the ice. And as we end this episode, we ask everyone to do something, no matter how big or small, to make sure that hockey truly is for everyone. We will talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Thanks you, Hillary. for doing this. You're the best.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye.